Hello, welcome to Whisper University. Uh, this year we're changing things up a little bit and we're interviewing uh, influential people in the internet and tech industry. I I'm Nathan Stuck, uh, CEO of Whisper and host of Whisper University. Um, thank you so much for being here. You can put comments in the, the comment session, ask us any questions. And uh, today we have Erica Myers from Microsoft with us. And I hate doing introductions. So I, Erica, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do for Microsoft. Sure, um, my name is Erica Myers. I am the lead for the Airband US Rural Program, which is Microsoft's initiative to address the digital divide in rural America. Okay. I nice. live in Maryland and I work out of the Washington DC office, the other Washington. The other Washington, right, right. Absolutely. Well, you know, boy, I think it's been about a almost a year, year and a half, well, probably actually almost a year and a half since uh, Whisper joined the Airband program. So tell me a little bit about the Air Airband initiative and what you're what you're trying to achieve with it. Well, um, honestly, I, I, I'm really just trying to build off of the wonderful work that Vicki Robinson established when she was in this position. She is now really leading all of Airband, um, which includes our international component, as well as our engineering and hardware team and our digital transformation team. So we have like really four units in on the Airband initiative. Um, she really started by um, identifying a number of internet service providers to be a part of the program and establishing like what our core priorities are and um, really the operating principles around how we're addressing the problem in the United States. And what I have been doing is really trying to um, build off of that, um, trying to develop programs that will help foster um, more work in the areas that she established. Uh, so, for example, you know, we are um, we have an, a, a marketing program. So I helped build out that marketing program that started as a pilot and really spread that to all of our partners and do more um, in that realm to help drive connections for our partners. Um, another thing that I'm really trying to do is really hone in on our work with like historically marginalized communities be that like tribal communities, um, African-American communities in rural America um, and, and really drive home that message. And then really just the general problems that are in rural America. Um, I, you know, I used to be a teacher in an under-resourced school. Um, I participated in the Teach for America program. And so my whole life has really been around um, working with people who were disadvantaged or who did not have what other people had. So I really um, don't like glaring disparities. And when you go into rural America, there's a glaring disparity around internet. And, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of people have said, or some people have said that internet is the um, electricity of the 21st century. And I'm really a proponent of that. I think that when you don't have access to technology and advanced telecommunications, you're at a disadvantage. Um, not sure. Just, so, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, what, what subjects did you teach or what, what, what were you teaching when you were a teacher? Oh, um, so I was a history and a poli-sci major in undergrad. Okay. And so I taught eighth grade um, social science. Oh, nice! In the Bronx, in the in the South Bronx, CIS wow. one sixty six. <laughs> okay, very cool, very cool. I think for me that the Airband program, what I what I like about it so much is, I can't remember how many years ago we had um, a gentleman come speak from Microsoft at one of our WISPA shows, and the program was very much appeared to be set up for more WISPs outside the U.S. It was more how do we ditch that, how do we, you know, solve the digital divide outside the U.S. And really, there's been this huge effort um, by your team to, to bring it into the U.S. and say, no, there is a digital divide here in the U.S. And, and we can be a power behind changing that. And, and I've really liked to see that transformation. And it's, and it's great. When we have our calls, they're, they're awesome to have. Well, what are you doing and how do we help? And, and we say, well, what are you doing and how do we help? And what are we trying to, to solve? So. I think that's uh, that's really cool how you guys have brought that program stateside, if you will, and have a more focus here. 
Yeah, I think that um, the relationships that you're talking about that we have with our ISPs is like the foundational element of the program. Like we are not an ISP and we can't do what we'd like to do without great partners. Um, Whisper, of course, is one of those great partners. And I, I, I love the whole concept of Whisper University and really trying to get this message out to the community. Um, but we couldn't do what we do without great partners like yourself, Nathan. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I think another thing that a lot of people had a, a mis, misunderstanding about the Airband program is that it was only for TV white space. It was only for, for the, the, the TV white space. And if you weren't going to use that equipment, it, it wasn't a program for you. Um, but you guys have really changed that. And, and you're, you're solving the digital divide with the best tools, the right tool for the right job. Can, can you talk a little bit about that transformation? I think it was a little bit before your time when you, when you came to the Airband program, but talk a little bit about that transformation, what you're trying, trying to solve there. Right. I think like right as I joined, so I joined in July of, of 2019. And I think right as I joined, they had um, already started signing up partners like yourself um, and other partners that were definitely um, multi-technology uh, companies, companies that were not just embracing TV white space, but embracing whatever the technology that, that was the right tool in the toolkit mm -hmm. um, for the job that you were serving. Um, and really, we've still had to do a lot of internal messaging around that shift from TV white space. I think that some people within Microsoft still um, only think about TV white space when they're thinking about us. And I think part of that is because we were working to set up an equipment ecosystem for TV white space. And, and they weren't, they were so dialed in on what we were trying to do there that they were losing sight of the fact that Airband Initiative was about addressing the digital divide in general. Um, and so we've really worked hard on the messaging this year to really um, um, to underscore that shift. Yeah, and I think it's an important one. It, there's nothing wrong with TV white space. It, it just it solves one part of what we're trying to solve. And, and there's so many more opportunities to solve. And I, I love the way you guys have led that change to say, no, we're we're getting people broadband in these rural markets by all means necessary to do it as fast as we can <laughs> and really, really have done a great job of that. So what are some of the resources that are available if you become an Airband um, member? You know, we're a small business and small businesses need extra help or open doors. What are some of those resources that you like to say, hey, this is something that you kind of get when you become one of our members? Sure. And that's like one of the things that I've tried to do in this position is really drive home what I call the value proposition mm -hmm. of partnering with Microsoft. Um, and really, we have like nine buckets of offerings and really trying to um, hone in on what those nine things are. And so one, of course, is the fact that we have this hardware and technology engineering um, group that can really provide a lot of assistance around um, actually design, um, equipment. And then what they do is they they not only help our partners from that perspective, and we also have um, pilots, pilot programs that they're supporting um, that are not like these more large scale projects. And the other thing that they do is they also then work with equipment manufacturers and like the tower companies and the fiber companies to um, identify opportunities to have low cost leasing options for our partners. So we're really trying to look at like all the kinds of things that would support our partners. So that could be financing, that could be helping them with access state and federal funding, that could help help them navigate blockers in state and federal um, funding. It could be um, driving ARPU for those um, those partners. So like what are other revenue streams? So obviously we're Microsoft, so we've got all kinds of Microsoft products and services that we can offer and create a revenue stream for our Yeah, I, I'd really never heard of your guys' name before we joined the program. I, I didn't know much <laughs> about Microsoft, right? But I think that's an important thing that I don't want to downplay is that you do carry a lot of clout when, when you walk in and you guys have helped us many, many times get in front of the right person. It wasn't that we couldn't, but we just couldn't get the meeting set and, and you guys were able to say, hey, we, we have a relationship there and, and we're willing to open the door for you. So I think that's been that's been a real good benefit for us that we've seen. Well, like Carl Garnett, who um, 
started Araban and Vicky and myself, we all three worked at the FCC and then um, as, as federal regulatory attorneys. And then Vicky was the, um, the acting CEO and the general counsel at USAC. And I was the deputy general counsel at USAC. So we have a mm -hmm. lot of experience with the universal service programs. And we kind of understand it from the policy side, as well as like, how does that policy get administered? You know, that's really important, especially like as you look at like these new programs that are just like coming out with like the emergency broadband benefit program. We're able to like interface with the people at the FCC and at USAC to really identify what is the opportunity, help our partners navigate that opportunity, and then help. I, I think a lot of what we're trying to do is operationalize opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And make it as simple and as turnkey as possible for our partners. And, and, and sometimes it's difficult because of the complexities, but really trying to um, streamline things um, and, and be a resource ourselves. But then we also um, have a consultant who um, used to work at the FCC and she's a very prominent consultant, um, but she also was like a, the architect of a number of these programs that we're talking about. And if she wasn't the architect, she was you know, in the room when it happened. So she understands like how the programs work and what the thought process is behind it. And we make her available as a resource to our partners. But, um, and then she also gives us insight. So really just trying to support our partners and use that, you know, I, a lot of times when I'm working on Airband, I think of like the little M and I think of Airband as the little M for Microsoft. But a lot of times the little M gets to leverage resources that the big mm -hmm. M has. And that's one of the things we do try to do is bring those resources to bear for our partners. And that could be our consultants. So we have consultants in every state of the country and really trying to help uh, marshal those consultants when there's an issue or, or, or we're also seen as like, um, a voice when when there's a um, a state that's like enact, enacting a broadband initiative or a new fund, people call on us because they know we're not an ISP ourselves. And I think mm -hmm. so I think we're in a unique position because by being a convener, um, we can give insight um, and almost we're seeing we're not really a not we're not a non-interested third party, but we are a third party. Mm -hmm. because we're not an internet service provider. So we're able to provide, you know, provide some insight, provide access to our partners um, and give our partners perspective. Because I think sometimes these states are really, um, I don't want to say they're beholden, but they're really heavily persuaded by the incumbents. And unfortunately, a lot of times the whole problem with access to broadband in the rural areas of the United States is is an incumbent problem, right? Yeah, exactly. Wait a minute. Why are you listening to the same people that still haven't solved the problem for 20 years, right? Why, why are you doing that? And they might actually be getting a lot of money to mm -hmm. not solve the problem. So right. that's the other right. thing, right? They got money for decades and, and decided they're not going to serve these areas. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that gets into the mapping and really how those resources are allocated. And that's one of the things that we've also tried to advocate for is, you know, new mapping, which I, I know this administration is, um, they, they um, appropriated, I think it's $65 million to do a new mapping campaign. Because before the way that um, the resources were divided, um, a, a an incumbent service can provider, all they had to say is, yeah, I can provide service to that sent to a location in that census block. And right. then that whole location was deemed to be served. And so all the folks living in all the places where they didn't serve don't have access to anybody to serve because there's not a financial reason or an economic interest. So really trying to fight that. So again, that gets back to like, if you understand how the policies are formulated or what they, what they depend on, then you can help kind of like fight at the at the at the core issues mm -hmm. yeah no I, I think you guys do a really good job i i'm on a different member list where i get information of what's going on in congress or what's going on on the hill or the fcc and i'm always amazed that the information i get from from the airband program is always a day or two ahead <laughs> you know you guys have digested whatever's been sent out and you get us the synopsis out very fast and those things so it's it's been been nice to be part of that and, and be able to, to 
have an opinion when people come ask me, well, what do you think about this? It's like, well, I don't know. I haven't even read about that yet, but no, no. And now I'm up on what's going on and, and it's been, it's been great. So let's just shift gears a little bit. And who are your partners and, and who, how do they become a partner of the Airband program? So we have um, 14 partners right now, um, and they're in about 26 states of Puerto Rico. Um, they tend to be internet service providers that focus on serving in rural America. Um, and that's typically the, the underserved and the unserved parts mm -hmm. of the country, of the rural, of the rural parts of the country. Um, I think that that's great because they understand the unique needs of those areas. Um, it's a very different, I mean, I don't have to tell you, Nathan, you know, it's a very different deployment model um, when you're trying to cover, you know, a few people in a, in a large area. I, I literally was on a call with a partner yesterday and they're like, we're going to build out a tower and that tower is going to cover less than 40 people. And that, mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, a, a tower that's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. Yes, right. But the thought is that that bill will help build on other bills that they're going to do. And so um, I've also been on calls with like state broadband folks who are like, I've got, um, they call it their pepper flakes. Um, they've got a problem where they have all these little, I call them chocolate chip cookies, but he called them pepper flakes, but they've got all <laughs> these little pockets of places where whoever's been serving and how they're serving is 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 not meeting the needs of all these little areas that are you know sp they're sparse right so they're not densely populated and they're kind of like sprinkled all around and so how do I get service to them and I know that there are a lot of people out there that believe like fiber is like you know the gold standard and that's the solution to everything but are you really going to build fiber out to all these little pepper flakes where like literally it's a home or right. a farm and that farm might be a very large farm that needs that that connection but it would cost you know tens and tens of probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to build some of these locations that i've seen right. and i was thinking like san diego county if people don't think of san diego county as rural because it has the term san diego in it but it's a very rural county and it's it's huge and it's like very um widely um dispersed where the where the people live and so you know when you're thinking like how is somebody going to build out fiber in that county i'm sure someone will deploy some but there are going to be so many people who are left out if, mm -hmm. if fiber is our only solution yeah right right tool for the right job so mm -hmm. for sure so so we have a question from um one of our viewers that says um, um D does Microsoft support using TV white space uh, for people to provide broadband in, in rural areas? And I, th I think this question is probably coming from, you know, we talked about how you guys are shifting to just with the right tool, but I would assume, and I'll let you answer, but I'll, I'll kind of put some words in your mouth a little bit that you still support TV white space in, in the use. Uh, it just isn't your only focus. Is that a, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And, you know, one of the things that we've been is, a, um, so I think it's, you know, one of the things is TV white space in the United States, right? Mm, is right. In other countries where they don't have as much broadcast, mm -hmm. there's less, um, the signals are more pure. And so there's right. less interference. Yeah. You guys have a trial going on down in South Africa, right? Oh, yeah. There, there's yeah. there's TV white space in a number of places outside the U.S. that, that mm -hmm. um, is deployed. And it can be a lot easier because they don't have as many um, TV stations. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was working with one of our partners, you know, they're, they, they love the idea of TV white space because it's, it solves problems where there's um, not, they call it non light of sight, mm -hmm. meaning there's obstructions between the house that you're trying to cover and, and, and the tower that you're going to provide the service from. But the problem with that, that's and so TV white space is a great solution for that. However, if that scenario is somewhere, it could be a very rural place, but it's somewhere near where radio signals are coming from a, a major me metropolitan area, then TV white space may still not work. So you mm -hmm. have to do some testing. It's not going to work everywhere 
that meets the use case, you still have to test and make sure that you have signal available and that you have a clear signal. Yeah, and, and to get a little technical on that, what we've seen in our testing is that even though the database says it's a clear open channel for us, when, when you look at TV white space and how far it goes, we've seen interference from 200, 300, 400 miles away. And, and so I look at TV white space, at least in the US, as being more of a small cell deployment where I'm going to keep it low to the ground. I'm going to burn through all those trees and, and get my distances. I'm not going to go stick it on high up on top of a tower or high on top of a mountain because then I just, you know, 200 miles in any direction in the U.S., you pick up lots of cities that have broadcasters. Yeah. Exactly what you were saying is that in other countries where they don't have nearly the number of, of broadcasters. So I don't think it's a non-starter in the U.S., um, but I think it's definitely you have to be very, very smart as to how you use that TV white space equipment. Uh, and it has a, probably a different use case than a lot of us were thinking originally when we were looking at the, the band. There's also the narrow band applications for TV white space, which are great for um, IoT or the yeah. end of things and small devices. Right. Um, and so, sure. Mm -hmm. And so you might have a situation where you're on a tower, you put you know, some unlicensed spectrum or some CBRS spectrum. And then on that same tower, you could put um, some TV white space um, that supports the IoT signals mm -hmm. and do it at a very low level. And then all, you'll be able to get readings off of all those sensors and you won't have to worry about interference. But that doesn't require, you know, the same, um, you know, high speed broadband requirements. Um, right. right. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. So that kind of brings me into one of my my final questions I have here is, you know, you get to work with different um, operators in the U.S. and different uh, partners that you have, and just everybody you get to work with. Are there any trends that you're seeing? What what do you what do you kind of see? Like when you take a step back and say, "Wow, I've talked to all these WISPs." What are you kind of seeing uh, from from us WISPs? More WISPs deploying CBRS technology, um, okay. and then more WISPs. Um, really contemplating um, fiber builds. So building mm -hmm. some fiber and then connecting the communities outside the fiber with the, with the fixed wireless. Um, okay. And so yeah. really having to realize like, you know, I had like some partners that are getting um, competition. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's funny because again, working at the FCC, um, you know, one of the things that like the FCC loves is competition because competition drives price down, right? Mm -hmm, right. But um, if you're a business and, and you've been marketing, you've been working in an area where you you didn't have a lot of competition and you've had to go, at, you know, it's been a hard go to do these deployments and get people signed up. You know, one of the things, I think a key thing to, to realize also is um, if people have been living without broadband, and they don't have a computer and they haven't really been using that computer, um, they don't necessarily know what to do with the computer and what to do with the bribing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you have like the scenario of the, the older family where they're getting broadband for when, you know, relatives come. And mm -hmm. so maybe they don't buy, well, here's, here's a challenge. I, I like to call it the electricity challenge. I said that broadband is like the electricity of the 21st surgery, century. Right, right. Broadband is not the kind of thing you have it, and once you have it, I can turn on all the lights or I can't. I could get a broadband connection and think that the broadband doesn't work because now I've got four people in my house on mm -hmm. Zoom calls and you know Apple watches and um, devices in the house, and I might not have the plan that I need. Um, and mm -hmm. so really helping our Airband partners do that kind of trial and error with their customers to make sure that they have the right plan that meets their needs. Because if I elect to have a low level plan, but I have high level needs, right. I may think that it's just not working for me, but I mm -hmm. don't have what I need. And so right. really trying to identify that. So that's where it's not like electricity. You either have hot water or you don't. You have mm -hmm. electricity, you don't. But with broadband, you could have broadband and not have what you actually need or to use. So yeah, the other difference I think with electricity is when I walk into my living room and I flip on the light and it doesn't come on, but I see the lights on in the hall and I see the light was on in my garage. 
I don't call my electric provider and say, your, your electricity sucks. Yes, right? But, right, but when, right. I, when I turn on my one computer and it doesn't get on the internet, oh, my internet provider sucks. This is ridiculous. Why, why can't they provide good? Yet internet is working all across the house for everything else. It's just the one computer. <laughs> it's probably not in my lifetime, maybe in my kid's lifetime, will, that people will understand that difference that, you, you know, when internet is working, it's working and it, it, individual devices can have problems. Well, it's funny because how many Microsoft calls have I been on where somebody has to turn their video off, including myself, yeah. because because it's just not robust enough for all for all the use that's happening at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a that's one wrinkle that I think people sometimes forget. But of course, ISPs know all too well. Like it's there, yeah. it's working. You just don't have what you need. Yep, yep. <laughs> I think the thing I'm really excited about. You mean you mentioned fiber and. Um, again, I'm, I'm a firm believer in right tool for the right job. And, and I know early on um, when I was working with the, the Airband, it was they weren't against fiber, but they really wanted to see our wireless plans, right? Because that's how you get it service out the fastest and that's what you do. But I think with us, us WIS, we're, we're entrepreneurs, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurs, we're solving. And our telephone industry has been so propped up by subsidies for so long that it's easy to pay a lot of money to have fiber put in the ground, right? It costs a lot and there's a lot that has to go into it. Well, yeah, because you're getting subsidies, you can afford to pay that. Whereas a lot of the entrepreneurs are like, well, I can't afford to pay that, but I want to do fiber. So how do I do it? Right. They, they solve the problem and they, I wouldn't say cut corners, but they, they create the solution. And one of the ones I love is that hybrid approach where, okay, I'm 20 miles away from fiber, but I still want to do fiber in this neighborhood because it's the right tool. Oh, well, I can drop in a wireless backhaul and still provide people amazing services. Um, and, and it's the right tool for the right job and where it kind of works. So I, I think that's great for our, our industry that we're always trying to solve problems that eh, just because other people can't solve them or won't solve them, or we're willing to do it. Yeah, that's I. Uh, that's the American spirit, though, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I think of. Like America is about solving problems and not saying, you know, we can't solve that problem. So all the problems that have been exposed during um, COVID-19, mm -hmm. they're all opportunities for, for people to use their noggins to come up with new solutions and new ways of thinking. And I think another thing that we're talking about implicit in our whole conversation is innovation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and, and people having to keep up with the innovation because I think, you know, what worked or what couldn't work or didn't work five years ago is stuff that can work now because mm -hmm. of the changes, the, the, the um, improvements in equipment, you know, that wireless backhaul that you were just referencing, you know, that may not have existed in the same way that it is now five years ago. CBRF right. we were talking about that wasn't as widely available 18 months ago as mm -hmm. it is now. So there and there are more innovations to come. Um, you know, there's the satellites in the sky, the the low Earth orbiting satellites that that Starlink and other um, carriers are are putting out there in the world. So there's there's more innovation to come, and who knows, you know. Who knows? I, I was just thinking about the unfortunate death of um, Prince Philip. And my husband and I, we were talking about like all that he saw in his life. Yeah, yeah. My wife and I were talking about that too. It's like, hold me out to pick his brain about what he saw so long ago to what he sees today. Yeah. Exactly. And and what are what it's gonna be like for our grandchildren, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there you know, I, my kids can't believe I didn't have a cell phone when I was a kid. <laughs> what did you do? What did you do? How, how did you survive? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I showed them what one looked like. I was like, it's the, they used to call it a brick, right? Because it was so huge. That's right. That's right. Yeah. My dad had to carry a brick when he was on alert from the Air Force, right? He's, I'm like, oh, dad, you got the brick. Yeah, I'm on call this weekend. <laughs> I used to work at an investment bank and we used to work on um, wireless deals. And one of the things were paging companies. And I had to teach my kids what a beeper was and what a pager was. They didn't they didn't know because we don't have that anymore. Now it's like, you know, it's a ubiquitous feature in all of our cell phones. So mm -hmm. right. the, so technology is changing, which is going to create innovation, which is going to be, you know, create more game changers and more um, more um, just great, more greatly impact the industry that as we know it. 
Um, and then I also think that on the flip side, as we're working on developing more high speed opportunities, developers are developing more rich applications that require more broadband. So it's it's kind of like innovation to meet the problem. And then you have a whole nother group of people innovating to provide more solutions and more opportunities. So it's it's almost like a competition, right? And one is always kind of lagging behind because you're trying to cover the whole country. Right. So right. It, it's interesting. No, it's exciting great. though. Yeah, it is. Things. things are always always changing. And I got to say that, you know, I didn't come into the internet industry planning for a pandemic and to be in the right industry when one hit, right? But I'm so thankful that I'm in the internet business during the pandemic. I mean, it didn't change our mission. Our mission has always been able to, to connect those that couldn't be connected otherwise. Uh, and that's what we're about and what we want to do. And the pandemic just made that mission even that much more critical. And, and how fast can we get it to people and you mentioned the, you know, the internet, you, the one you have may not be enough to, you know, DSL is the new dial up in most areas. It, it's so slow, especially for the upload for trying to do Zoom and, and, and all the different uh, online, uh, online video chatting that everybody's doing. But I will say, uh, Nathan, you're right about being in the right industry. But the other thing is um, just, and I know this from like the very first time that I met you, you were talking about something that was very passionate to you you're a very positive person. And mm. so positive people make lemonade out of lemons. And then mm. of course, that's also again, where innovation comes and really having like vision that there can be more and people can do more. Um, so that's also, you know, a, a big testament to you and your leadership. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. So if somebody wants to join the Airband program, how do they do that? What do they, what do they do? Um, I think probably the the best thing is to just reach out to me um, and and um, I'm I'm at Microsoft. Eric, well, my name is butchered a million ways of spelling, <laughs> but um, we also have an air. If you go on the internet and you Google or Bing Airband um, Airband Initiative, it would give you a way to like reach out to us um, okay. Through the through the through the email, if people know you, they could contact you. Yeah, absolutely. And we just do a call. We do, we do a call and like set it up on and and talk talk through where people are located, who they're trying to serve, and how can we help. Okay. No, that's great. We also have an ISP program. Okay. And so for like smaller carrier carriers, um, let's call it like a lower touch model. Um, there are over 500 um, ISPs in the United States in our Airband ISP program. Um, there are, are also um, low cost discount offerings um, for a number of different equipment manufacturers and other types of providers to support their um, network deployments. And there's a newsletter that goes with that and other information. And we're always working on offerings to expand for them as well. Okay. So there's really kind of two tiers. The, um, the more commercial, we call it our commercial Airband partners, really yeah. our Airband partners. And then there's the Airband ISP program. Okay. Well, so that, that's, that's another good to one. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question from one of our viewers. It asks if the Airband program is available in Europe. So we actually have, um, we're actually working on a project in Ireland um, right now, but um so the international airband program is mostly focused on South America, Africa, and Asia with a heavy um, emphasis in Asia on India. Um, okay. And that the goal of the international program is to cover 40 million people. Um, wow. and so, yeah. So in the U S it's 3 million, which, mm -hmm. you know, based on the latest FCC data, which of course we don't believe is is accurate, but but according to the FCC, there's over eight million people in in the rural parts of the United States that don't have access. 12, 12 million, 14 million, 20 million. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a whole nother show we could have. We, we won't go into all that. <laughs> but but internationally, we're trying to cover forty million people. Right. So okay. so yeah, uh, but there is a there is a project in Ireland. Well, I, I will volunteer. I love travel. 
uh, and you know, let's get COVID out of the way. I will volunteer to go meet with anybody in, in Europe that, that wants to know more about the program. I'll, I'll tell them all about it. Uh, South Africa, <laughs> South America, you just have passport, we'll travel. You know, I'm just saying that's what I'm willing to do. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. And, and we're, we're in Colombia, South America. A number of people have um, gone to Colombia um, and it's, it's beautiful. Um, and the impact that we're having there is, is amazing. You know, one of the other things that we're trying to do is partner with um, corporations that are also focused on uh, or, or would like there to be better broadband in rural America. So mm -hmm. we rolled out a um, strategic alliance with Land O'Lakes. And we're really trying to partner with Land O'Lakes um, to drive broadband deployments in rural America through like a kind of like public private partnership. Um, Amer um, Land O'Lakes founded something called the American Connection Project. And Microsoft is a founding member of that group. And that's just a number of different, it's over a hundred, I believe it's over 140 companies at this time um, that are focused on um, broadband in rural America. So that's like a, advocacy is another piece of what we do. We, we try to band together with like minds and really push for more um, programs at the federal and state level to support broadband. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know you're over the Airband US initiative. Um, I got to go to your Airband summit uh, right before COVID. And I, the, one of the speakers you had there was talking about broadband in Africa and, and how, you know, the ARPU there, average revenue per user is like $5 per month. Mm -hmm. And what it was an allowing them to do though, is these, they, they didn't even have power at their, at their houses, but because they had broadband, they could, another company came in and said, hey, we're going to rent you the solar panel and, and everything or, or lease it to you. And, and because we have broadband, we can control it, turn it on, turn it off, make sure you're paying your bill, collect. and you know, we don't think about it in the U.S., right? I mean, our, our poor drive to the, the food lines and, and there's, a, there's a totally different dynamic. My wife's from South Africa, so I've been able to go back there as well. And I just think it's awesome that the holistic approach that you guys are taking to solving that our digital divide here in the U.S. is a very, very important one. Um, it takes on a whole new meaning when you look outside the U.S. as to what it's enabling people to do. And I, I, I encourage everybody to go kind of look up some of the projects you guys are working on and how, how cool they were and how they're just totally different. I never thought about the different projects out there. You know, I, I think that what you just said is really important um, because we kind of lose sight of like how we live in the U.S. But I'll tell you, I went to um, I was at a, a seminar in D.C. Um, for um Native Americans, um, like in companies that are serving Native Americans living on tribal land. And, you know, one of our air band partners, Sacred Wind, um, which is out in New Mexico, they had these pictures where they're, um, they're serving people who are living on tribal land. And the people were living in like sheds that you buy at, at Home Depot or Lowe's. They yeah. did not have running water and they didn't have electricity. And so they had a solar panel. And then because of that solar panel, they could also have a broadband connection. And the people were doing, you know, schooling inside the home with this broadband connection and power from the solar panel. And I just bring that up because you see these stories internationally, but we have places in the U.S. where like people are living like that, too, um, which is like really unfortunate. Um but the the good story is there are solutions for those people. Mm -hmm. and, and just like you said, like there's a good story internationally where there's a solution to provide um, power and to provide broadband. Um, so mm -hmm. that's that's, you know, again, the innovation to solve a problem. Yeah, just absolutely. You. Absolutely. So uh, any closing remarks, anything uh, that we didn't touch on, something you want to share, uh, share with all of our viewers? They, if they are viewers of yours, they already know how amazing you are and the work that you're doing. <laughs> but you. I would just like to say, you know, one thing that I think um, gives me hope is that, um, again, all of our partners are working to so solve this problem. Um, the last thing I would say is that the Airband program also has an urban component to it mm -hmm. where, um, that we just launched in July as part of Microsoft's Racial Equity Initiative. Um, we launched a pilot in LA 
and we're doing pilots in um, a number of other cities, and then hopefully we'll do some more pilots next year. And these are um, these are uh, focused on areas that are like almost like urban deserts, right, where mm -hmm. people have access to broadband, but it's so expensive, and they're in low income low income housing that they don't have. They basically, um, you know, by definition, don't have access to broadband. So that's like another thing that we're trying to do. And that's also part of the digital divide. And so that's addressing affordability, um, affordable devices and digital skilling. And then we're bringing more, last thing, in the rural America, we're bringing more um, partnerships to bear around digital skilling so that our airband partners have more digital skilling offerings to offer their communities. We're going to be launching a hotline next month um, for all areas covered by our, our Airband partners to be able to. It's a, it's a phone hotline where people can call in and get help with um, digital skilling issues and questions. And then we have a virtual trainings that are going on with National 4-H. And then when we can be back in person, we'll have more in-person training with National 4-H. Mm -hmm. And we're also looking to bring in another partner to help with digital skilling in our Airband communities. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, a high note. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for us to be back in person because I, I want to offer up our buildings. We have offices all over the Illinois and Missouri. And hey, do training at our place and, and get, bring in the right people to help. The more people are connected, the, the better it is uh, for them and their families and and everything. So I think that's uh, great that the work you guys are doing and I'm, I'm glad we can be part of it. Awesome. So, yeah. Thanks so much for being on the call. Um, anybody who, who wants to, to join our Facebook page, you can, or watch our YouTube uh, Whisper University. Uh, we have a YouTube channel as well. So thanks so much. Have a great uh, rest of your week. And Erica, thank you so much again for being, being on the call with us. Thank you for having me. I was super nervous, but I really do appreciate it. So thank Yeah, you. you did a great job. You did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Bye -bye. a lot. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>